Hello, welcome back to the first film ever screened. I'm a steam engine barreling directly towards you. Run! I sacrifice many things for art, you know, time, money, sometimes small animals. This light is so hot, for example. This isn't dewy skin, this is profuse sweat, the things I do for this family. My body isn't so much a temple as it is a conference room a Scientologist keeps an electropsychometer. But sometimes I sacrifice too much and I suffer, or the people around me suffer, and I wonder, is this sustainable or even, is this ethical? How far am I willing to go for entertainment? Am I willing to warp or damage my own mind? And who is caught in the crossfire? More on this in a second after this sponsor, Past Rose, take it away like you always do. And go. Forgive me for not having makeup or, or nice hair for this, this, this ad read. It's actually 600 million degrees in Seattle and I sweat through every single thing that I put on. And now with this hot light on, I feel like I'm going to combust. If you put an egg on me, it would cook. If you put me on the sidewalk, I would too. You guys ever heard of the economy? I'm an expert, and according to the sacred Adam Smithian manuscripts, it's inflation, so money is weird and can float like a dirigible airship. Which is why I'm so glad this video is sponsored by Upside. Upside is an app that gets you free cash back if you spend money at select stores, restaurants, or gas stations. And did I mention gas stations? Because holy hell, they give you money for getting gas. I didn't think this was possible, but somehow it is. I was driving around with my girlfriend the last few days, and we would have to stop and get gas, and I would say, babe, uh, hold on, I can use Upside to get us cash back. And she would say, wow, you're so attractive. Uh, you may look like a haphazard medieval portrait of a closeted squire, but financially you operate like a lord allocating fiefs. And that made me confused. It's super easy. You just download the app, then you can look at the offers on the app, uh, claim one, check in at the business, pay however you want to pay, and run the receipt through the app to get paid. You win, Upside wins, I win, and by extension, meritocracy wins. And by that extension, the Pontifex loses. You also get way more cash back with Upside than with like traditional like credit card programs or like loyalty programs. And you can cash out at any time to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Upside users are earning over a million bucks a week, and the app has 4.8 stars. It's it's good, it's good. So if you want in on this, go to the App Store or Google Play, uh, download the free Upside app, and then use promo code ROWRANDON to get five bucks or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more, or go to the link in the description. It's a no-brainer, I have a brain, and I didn't even have to use it for this. Thank you, Upside, back to the video. Welcome back to the channel. If you subscribe right now, I'll get better. I, I promise, Th this time I want this to work, you know? I, I don't want you to make the mistake your mother did. Look at me, I care about you. My roommate's in the room while I'm filming because otherwise I can't get anything done. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm exhausted, beaten down, dejected. I'm an underdog with an overbite. Nothing seems to go right in my life, but every day I get up because I'm holding out hope that Mitch McConnell will die like a Looney Tune and I'll get to watch the live leak recording. You know, his whole body just screams squished by a falling anvil that makes a whistling noise. You just know they keep painting fake entrances to the Senate and he keeps smacking into them and his face folds up like a Sharpay. I have a lot of trouble watching television. I have ADHD, which makes it hard for me to pay attention to stuff. I have OCD, which has given me a lot of anxiety about like subject matter in television. Uh, and TV really hasn't been good since Quibi, so who cares? I'm kidding. I do have ADHD, OCD, uh, HBO Max, Criterion Channel. I've been looking at Tubi because they have a lot of good movies. What I'm trying to say is watching TV, a medium famous for open endings and breadth of content, makes me uneasy and nervous. Like watching an elderly person step out of a lifted SUV. They look down at the curb like they're on Big Sur about to base jump. Like, why didn't you just get a sedan? You're gonna die doing this. So when a TV show hooks me and I watch it all the way through, I know I'm being compelled to engage in a way that I usually have trouble with. Uh, that happened this year with Atlanta, Succession, and Russian Doll. Although I have my criticisms of those shows, all of them were delicately crafted stories that progressed each episode and kept me invested, which is more than I can say for some. <laughs> Looking at you, Breaking Bad. This is the sequel to Malcolm in the Middle. It makes no sense in that fucking universe. Why would Hal sell meth? He loves his wife and kids. I have an even harder time with movies. I saw Lawrence of Arabia in theaters, and the only thing I remember is Alec Guinness playing a Syrian king. I don't know how they thought that would age. Alec Guinness looks like a Winston Churchill Funko Pop. That's a grade A white man. He could stand stick straight in an Ikea display room and you'd think he was a floor lamp. The fan, the fan, fan, fan. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Nonetheless, when I heard Nathan Fielder was making a new show, my ears perked up as his show, Nathan For You, was a mainstay in my house in high school. I recall showing it to my friends and watching it with my sister many times and reveling in the absurdity. Uh, so I was excited to see what he had in store and what he had in store was, um, actually, let's just start from the top with Nathan Fielder is a comedian known best and most relevantly to this video uh, for his show Nathan For You, which aired on Comedy Central from 2013 to 2017 to widespread acclaim. The concept for this show was simple, you know, pose as an expert and help small businesses. See, Nathan is a comedian, but he happens to have a business degree that he never uses. So he figured that in this show, he had fertile grounds for a reality spoof style comedy. Have a business owner write to you for help, go to their business, propose an entire... 
I'm sorry, can you get killed at a different time? Is me filming this video an inconvenience for you? I can stop. Have a business owner write to you for help, go to their business, propose an entirely ridiculous solution, watch it fail, and film the whole thing. The thing about Nathan- Oh my god, I'm so fucking so- There's like sweat in my eyes, this isn't okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. The thing about Nathan for you, though, is that it's fucking brilliant. The show is so ridiculously over the top, it is indulgent in any comedic idea that a writer's room could have. There's an episode where he makes a business put a sale for a ludicrously inexpensive TV on a flyer. Then when the people show up, they have to be in black tie, and then they're made to crawl through a really small door, and then past that door, there is a live alligator guarding the television. There's an episode where he impersonates a man and does a tightrope walk for charity just so that the guy can take all of the credit for what he just did, but it's weird and bizarre and involves getting the guy a girlfriend through convoluted means that are like completely inappropriate. For a high school Rose Ramden, this was the height of entertainment. And for a 20 year old Rose Ramden, it's still the height of entertainment. This is, it's great. What's essential to note about the show though is that it is a satire in a sense, um, but a satire of what? It is simultaneously like crystal clear and obfuscated by what happens in the actual show. On one hand, it is clearly a satire of shows where a quote unquote expert enters and tries to overhaul somebody's life, business, relationship, etc., to show them how to live, live a truly happy or fulfilling or successful life. And in a way, it succeeds with flying colors, as without words, it sort of highlights the absurdity of being able to make substantial structural improvements without consistent attention. A TV show crew coming up and working with you for a month isn't a legitimate solution. At the same time, though, it is the exact same as those shows and revels in it. In proposing preposterous solutions to mundane problems, it highlights the structure of reality shows that makes them exploitative entertainment. The show isn't there to help people, it is there to make the show. If the show is, uh, in a cursory sense, about helping the people, it will be there for X amount of time until they have enough footage to make that impression. But this raises questions about the ethics of a show like this. This satire, of course, has a semi-clear subject, but in seeking authenticity and emulation of the source material, uh, it eschews morality and takes on a sort of... Uh, malicious atmosphere. It can feel like we're laughing at or even demeaning people when you watch this show, which brings not only Nathan, but us into a state of culpability for the adverse impacts of the reality format and the format of the show itself. But in thinking about it like this, I'm forced to question if this is any worse than the actual reality show that manufactures drama or steamrolls through restaurants or small businesses touting their ability to whip them into shape and turn them upside down. The key difference between these two shows is that Nathan is forthright in a way about what he intends to do to these businesses. We are watching a comedy show about absurdist solutions to business problems, they are meant to put people in uncomfortable and awkward positions so that the audience can laugh. However, the business owners are real business owners who are not exactly involved in the sort of entertainment agreement between the audience and the comedian, so they aren't aware of the reputation or the stakes at hand. Nathan softens this blow by occasionally shifting the subject of the show to himself in sneakier ways, highlighting his difficulty connecting with people, socializing, or finding love along the way. In these moments, it feels like a curtain is being lifted by the great antagonizer to show that perhaps he is on the same level as the people he showcases. Okay. I wonder though if it is enough. I recently saw a clip of the show that I had forgotten about in which Nathan wants to improve a pet cemetery by making videos of pets saying goodbye to the children of owners. When showing one of these to a father and son, the child, probably only around five, starts to cry. He's upset by Nathan's actions that, of course, were intended to amuse and beguile the audience. Is this worth it? Is it really okay for me to watch a show that makes a child cry over his dead pet for my enjoyment? That's up to the individual viewer. There is no sort of sacrosanct emotional currency we can weigh in a utilitarian fashion to measure that this is ethical. What if this costs the business owners crucial time? What if they are embarrassed or humiliated by their portrayal in the show? This is reality television and figures are rarely portrayed as statically positive in such a program, sure, but should we just stop extending sympathy to anybody who appears in an exploitative reality show? I guess Nathan For You feels particularly pernicious because it ropes small business owners in on the promise of helping them and then proceeds to do the social equivalent of blindfolding them and spinning them around a bunch. I'm not saying that Nathan only helps good people or that the people in his shows deserve or are entitled to legitimate advice or success. Some people that Nathan interacts with are undeniably scumbags, but this is a gray area of entertainment. Broadly speaking, reality television is exploitative. It paints people as hysterical antagonists for the sake of narrative structure and audience engagement. And in this way, Nathan is different. Oftentimes, Nathan does whatever he can do to prevent the business owner from becoming rowdy or uncertain of his ideas. So they end up being timid or agreeable. This is a 
of course, in conjunction with the full production crew, cameras in your face, boom mics, etc. The owners and their businesses, you know, the real people, end up becoming comedic prompts for Nathan to engage in creative writing exercises off of, iterating and reiterating, adding new fantastical twists to his fan fiction of their life. Since Nathan is behind all of the god-awful propositions in the show, he comes off as silly or incompetent, as well as timid and afraid of confrontation. This is different, though, as he is the lead creative force behind the show and stands to lose comparatively little from blunders or a business owner saying no, as he could simply move on to another episode. Don't get me wrong, though. This style of timid interaction serves as manipulative fodder. When Nathan plays into discomfort and awkwardness, he's sort of able to use it as a centripetal force to slingshot himself out of the conversation and into an easy conclusion. He frequently maintains his status as a calm, level-headed, rational interlocutor and gradually presses uncomfortable questions that aren't deserving of real attention or answers into the interaction, eventually ending either in the other conversational partner conceding to him or a comedic stalemate. Okay, that all was a lot, but that is nothing compared to... Oh boy. I, wa I watched this show with my with my roommate Mo right over there. This show is so fucking good. It's, um, it's, it's brilliant. So good. It's, it's genius. Boy. It's genius. Yeah, watch it. I mean, it's insane. It has been a long time since I watched a piece of comedy and felt that it was like a magnum opus. You know what I mean? Uh, in fact, I don't remember the last time it was I watched something that I felt that way about, but the rehearsal just might be the latest. It is positively awe-inspiring in its commitment to its concept. The premise this time is not so simple. People are nervous about uncomfortable social situations. What if we rehearsed for these situations to a ridiculous degree? You know, built sets of the place where it would happen, hire actors to shadow real people, and then imitate them in improvisational arguments and confrontations and show it all in a television show. And then in addition to that, what if we took it all way too far? Okay, so from this point on, there will be spoilers for the rehearsal. If you wanna skip them, go to this part. Um, however, if you wanna keep watching, that's cool too, because saying these things out loud cannot capture exactly what the show does. Um, also, if you're going to watch it, Google trigger warnings, because there's some stuff that kind of pushes the envelope a bit, and I don't want anybody to get, uh, triggered. The show begins innocently enough with this episode where Nathan offers to help a man admit to his bar trivia friend that he lied about having a master's degree and only has a bachelor's. The episode is by the numbers, Nathan Fielder absurdity, but the second episode is where things kick into gear and you're introduced to the main narrative through line for the rest of the show. Nathan intends to take a middle-aged woman who hasn't had children and simulate the experience of having a child. How does he do this? Well, he doesn't really. His plan is to use dozens of child actors due to labor laws to station her in her dream house in the middle of nowhere, to swap the children out daily via windows or other surreptitious means, and to age the child at three years and simulate weather patterns and growth of the garden uh, as to give the true experience of 18 years of growth. I am frankly flabbergasted by this show. To do this, he recruits Angela, an incredibly Christian woman, and Robin, an incredibly Christian man, to enter into this sort of agreement. First off, Robin does some insane stuff on this show and has enjoyed a bit of relevant since its release. I'm not gonna get into all of that, but oh boy. And second of all, he leaves like five hours under the first night and Nathan decides to fill in for him in the rehearsal. This is among the many strokes of true brilliance that went into this show. Nathan is no longer an observer of the rehearsal. He is a part of it. Whereas in Nathan For You, he was constantly the arbiter in the rehearsal. He frequently finds himself as the protagonist in his own shenanigans. Later in the show, Nathan hosts a sort of acting course where he teaches people the fielder method, essentially stalking other people and imitating them, studying them like wildlife. During this rehearsal, Nathan struggles with one of the actors, so he restages the lessons with an actor to play Nathan as instructor, and himself in different clothes, and a wig as the struggling actor. So somebody else becomes Nathan, he becomes the actor, he lives out that life. It's fucking insane. At the end of one of those lessons, he walks into a room where one of the crew members for their show passes him a release form. Through voiceover, he notices everyone else is signing theirs quickly, and meditates briefly on feeling intimidated and pressured by this process. This is like so smart, but but it's also really dumb to me. I need to, I guess I need to explain that. So Nathan is very aware of the things he does to get people to be in his shows. Every single step of this process is coercive because of his status, uh, you know, as a television creator. He is able to use media attention, cameras, budgets, etc., to convince people to do things they otherwise wouldn't. It's manipulation, and in real time, he becomes acutely aware of that and brushes it off as a necessary evil of continuing with his show. Self-awareness in itself is not a solution to an ethical quandary, but both Nathan and myself, and probably you, still want the show to exist. We stand now at an impasse between between our want to be entertained and our need to behave responsibility. Responsibly. Responsib behave responsibility? Fuck me. <laughs> Shut up. Okay, actually from this point on, if you haven't seen the finale, uh, you, can, you might wanna skip this because the finale is incredible. So 
to that same timestamp. In the last episode, it is revealed that one of the child actors in Nathan's simulation has developed an emotional connection to Nathan and wants Nathan to be his father. His mother explains that she's single and he sees that other kids have fathers and is latched onto Nathan as that in his life after Nathan played the role in the rehearsal. There's a sincerely heartbreaking moment where Nathan is trying to get the kid to go home with the mom and the kid says, I don't want you to be Nathan. I want you to be daddy. Nathan tries to better this by going and meeting with the boy and his mother and then eventually he brings another child actor along with him to play with the boy and then he actually did that as like a secret operation and he made sure that the child actor observed all the boy's mannerisms and then he launches into a full rehearsal where he plays the boy's mother and the actor plays the boy and there's this crazy crescendo at the end. But during this section he playfully comments on how the show is a weird thing for a child actor to do and yeah. It is a weird thing for a child actor to do. In the book Comedy, a short introduction by Matthew Bevis, uh, Matthew Bevis quotes and references a lot, so these quotes I'm gonna read, they're gonna immediately defer from him. He's gonna quote somebody else. Bevis writes, according to Bergson, Henry Bergson, the truly comic figure is a kind of monomaniac, unaware that he is comic, and laughter at such figures is issued as a corrective in order to return them to their humanity. So comic character has a ridiculous kind of compulsion to repeat. Someone has become their own self-parody through too faithful an adherence to what makes them tick. Now, Bevis goes on to criticize this a bit, but I think it's really critical and uh, relevant to the rehearsal. In Nathan's shows, Nathan, playing himself, plays a character meant to be read as his true self. He is meant to be monomaniacal and unaware of the comedy of his situation. However, the other people in the show are not always actors, or if they are actors, are treated as both regular people and actors. So Nathan remains the only one truly aware of his unawareness. This is a power imbalance that tips the scales in his favor and allows him to pull the performances and reactions he wants from people in order to make the best show. And I liked watching the best show. Bevis writes, the anthropologist Mary Douglas sees a joke as a play upon form, as a right and an anti-right. The pleasure lies in the way that it plays with our sense of what might be allowable. The Joker as God promises a wealth of new, unforeseeable kinds of interpretation, she writes. A joke implies that anything is possible, and perhaps it also implies that anything can be made to happen simply by expressing the wish for it. In the earliest surviving comedy in the Western canon, Aristophanes' The Acarnians, 425 BC, Dicaeopolis issues an order to his associate Euripides. The tragedian replies, sorry, it's not possible. The comedian's response, do it anyway. In this comic universe, the counterfactual becomes good. Comedy sometimes implies that the world will become the world we want the best of all impossible worlds. The rehearsal is a warped Eden, a perfectly constructed, self-aware, oxymoronic anomaly. Every moment of this show feels wrong. We shouldn't be showing that person. They shouldn't be saying this. You're making them feel bad. That child actor should not be doing that. But those moments in succession feel almost orchestral, like one movement after another, forming this grandiose comedic symphony and statement that swells and beckons, demanding the listener to ask more, to listen harder, to watch closer, and to question everything around them and who shows it to them. It is at once genius and deplorable, admirable and reprehensible, inspiring and perturbing. It is a reality television show. That's a banger last line. Can I, can I have my roommate come over here to do the outro with me? Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, if you want to support me, you can support me on Patreon, uh, but don't do it for the perks because I'm bad at the perks. So just do it because you love me and you think I'm so funny and so cute. Um, do that. Uh, thank you to Upside for sponsoring this video. Go to the link in the description for more information about that. Love you, Upside. Big smooches. Uh, money back on gas. I need to tell you to download that app. I'm going to tell him how to download that. But um, yeah, that's about it. I hope you all have a lovely day. Uh, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Take care of yourself and others. Remember that you're loved. Um, yeah, as always, it's been a pleasure. Uh, until next time. I'm Mo. And I'm Ro. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so cold, no, 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 I